Introduction to Nursing Concepts, Medication Administration, Part 4. This is Martha Olson. Looking at our nursing diagnosis, we need to, again, prioritize these. Page 588 discusses these in the Potter and Perry. The related two modifiers you can think about to add on to each one of these. For me, the impaired swallowing is the number one nursing diagnosis that I see listed. And probably the second is non-compliance of medications. When they don't take their meds or follow the guidelines, there's potential for toxicity, decreased therapeutic levels of the medication. For patients that are non-compliant that take seizure medications, they can have a seizure. For people that uh, get a low blood level with an antibiotic, they then become resistant to antibiotics. So non-compliance is a big issue in medication administration. When we look at the planning phase, then we always want to collaborate with a variety of healthcare providers when administering any medications. Talk with the pharmacist, see what they think about it. You know, visit with the doctor, give him a call if you have questions about anything related to meds, especially if it involves safety. It's important to collaborate with family and friends whenever possible. Maybe they have some insight that might help us know why they don't take their meds or why they're non-compliant with their medications. In our case study that we're following along then, Emilio plans a teaching session with Esther. A couple of things to keep in mind that we will be talking about in the teaching and learning unit is to make the teaching at their level. They say to make all of your writing at a sixth grade level because um, most people do not understand it if it's written any higher. Stay away from abbreviations or words that we in the medical field understand, but Esther might not understand. So if you write, take this medication, PRN, Esther might not understand what it means to take it PRN. You would want to write out as needed for pain. When we look at implementation to promote health, you know, teaching is a huge part of what we do. Why they take it, how to take it, what side effects to look for, what happens if they don't take it. A big one with many of the medications is to not just discontinue that medication abruptly because people can have some very severe health effects from just quitting taking a medication. What can happen is people start taking a medication and they don't feel any better. Let's take an antidepressant for example. They take the medication and their depression isn't any better, but yet now they have side effects. Maybe they're lethargic. For men, sometimes side effects of medication such as impotence can be an issue. And so you have to kind of do a lot of teaching that it takes six weeks for an antidepressant to make you start feeling better. And you may have side effects before that time, but you need to keep taking this medication to get the blood level up. The other class of medications that I can think of that tend to take a while to see the therapeutic effect is any of your endocrine uh, medications. Several nursing interventions to promote adherence to the medication regimen and foster their independence. You know, do they need to set out meds? Do the home health nurses need to come in and set up the meds for the week so that they take them correctly? How can they cope better with problems that are caused by the medication? Sometimes just knowing to take it on an empty stomach, to take it with a meal might help with some GI distress that people experience. And then do they maybe need a referral to community health? When we look at the implementation phase of the nursing process in acute care, we want to make sure that we calculate and measure very correctly. We want to be accurate. When a doctor orders a heart medication, if we just sloppily measure that, we could give them too much and cause a very severe uh, problem with that later. Under special considerations, infants and children, we will have a couple of test questions related to dosing and uh, the psychological preparation of children before they take a med. We always want to explain it at their level. Never explain it to a child too early because then they just build anxiety. And so you just, you know, go in the room and you ask them if they would like their, you know, medication with juice or water, if that's appropriate. Maybe you want to ask them what kind of treat they would like after they take their medication um, for you. And so make the choices positive ones. Never put medication in the food of a child that they like because then they're going to equate that with that medicine being in there and they might quit eating that favorite food of theirs. So they say it's best to give them their medication and then offer a positive choice afterwards. So maybe if they like pudding or popsicles, uh, offer that afterwards. With the elderly, 
Make sure you know that you are looking at their liver and kidney function because they can become toxic very easily with lower muscle mass in the elderly. Sometimes we have to alter or decrease the dose that they get. Make sure you follow the six rights of medication. Follow the policy of that agency. Document after you give the medication. And then look at um, how, how you would uh, look for the reaction for that potential medication. As we look at our case study with Emilio then, what evaluation strategies might be appropriate for these teaching strategies? How will Emilio know that his teaching has been effective? And then think about your own teaching strategies as you would be working with Esther. Emilio uh, will provide the teaching materials. Again, make sure you include pictures, things that are appropriate for their level. If they don't speak English, make sure that it's in whatever language that they would be able to read and understand. And then look at, uh, was it effective? Do I need to go back in on another day and maybe teach or have a video? We always kind of look at how they learn best. And some people, it's one-to-one -one dialogue. Some people are hands-on learners and maybe would um, need more of a tactile learning scenario with Emilio. Polypharmacy is when a patient takes two or more medications to treat the same illness, two or more meds from the same chemical class, uses two or more meds with the same or similar actions to treat several disorders at the same time, or they mix supplements and herbal things with their meds. On page 591, it gives a definition of polypharmacy, and with that, we know the risk for adverse reactions increases with each medication that they take. So to minimize that, we try to communicate with the pharmacist and with the physician as to um, medications that they're on, are they appropriate? Do we need to maybe look at what we could decrease or uh, use a different medication for them? In looking at evaluation on page 592, we know the evaluation is an essential role of that professional nurse. It requires a lot of skill and critical thinking to be able to analyze, look at the knowledge of the meds, how does it work, what is the pathophysiology of that medication on the body? What will it do to the blood pressure, to the vitals, to the anxiety, whatever the med is for? It's more effective when you value the patient's participation. So partner with them, talk with them, teach them so you can determine do they understand their medication and are they able to take it as it's prescribed. Some patients struggle with their medication schedule. If it's ordered three or more times a day, that's a lot of times to remember. Did I take my medication or not? Ask the patient to describe its effectiveness because uh, you can't evaluate it unless you have that patient's response to that. As we look at our case study then, uh, Emilio decides on the strategies to help Esther with that and he writes out that schedule and again make sure it's written so that the lay person can understand that. Um, I remember once working with a couple they were to give injections. He was to give injections to his wife. Everything was written out very nicely but the nurse had written give one cc. On the label it said give one milliliter and he did not understand that milliliters and cc's were exactly the same. So they called me in knowing I was a nurse and I said they are the same, but the nurse truly should have written give one milliliter or whatever was written on the label so that they matched and there was less confusion for that couple that was doing medication administration at home. With medication administration, we will be doing the oral route, which is by mouth or written as PO per os. Topical can be uh, into any of the orifices, the skin, the nose, eyes, ears, the vagina, and the rectal area. Inhalation is lungs at your inhalers, at your breathing treatments. We irrigate a lot of uh, things in the body. We can irrigate the eyes, we can irrigate the vagina, we can irrigate uh, the rectum. And then when we look at parenteral, that's our IM injections, intramuscular, um, intradermal, subcutaneous. So each one of those comes with uh, special instructions and what we need to look for in our uh, next section will include very specific directions for those. Oral is the easiest and most desirable. 
We know that food can affect that. Geodon is a medication I mentioned earlier that if you don't take it with enough food, it will not be therapeutic. We worry about the risk of aspiration. Behind that bullet, put people you think might be at higher chance of aspirating medications. A stroke patient that's had dysphagia. A child that maybe uh, isn't used to swallowing pills and maybe it would be more appropriate to get them liquid medication. And then when we think about our enteral feedings, we will have a whole unit on that where we um, do the tube feeding and we need to do a lot of nursing education as to uh, what we need to look for and how we need to do that. We need to use liquids when we do an NG or a G tube feeding because uh, the pills that we crush and try to put in a little bit of fluid oftentimes plug. Patients usually are able to self-administer oral medications. Sometimes we look at uh, failure to follow the evidence for following the medication uh, administration record. And when liquid medications are not available, it's not always appropriate to crush medications, especially if they are in a, a gelatin, if they are in a scored uh, or in a capsule for us. Topical medications. We always want to have the skin cleaned first, so you would want to think about the most appropriate time we would want to administer a topical medication. Sometimes it, it's ordered for 9 o'clock in the morning, but it may not be appropriate to go and do my 9 o'clock topical medication when the CNA is going to come in 20 minutes later and do the bath. Make sure that you use gloves or you will get the therapeutic effect of that. Nitroglycerin paste is one that I can think of. You will get an instant headache if you are not wearing gloves. Make sure that if it's an open wound because of infection control, you would want to make sure that we are following sterile technique to put the topical medication. Uh, Silvadine is a very common medication put to burns. And Silvadine, if you remember from pharmacology, um, has allergies with sulfa. So you'd want to assess for sulfa allergies with that. Patches are becoming more and more common. Transdermal patches can be duragesic for pain. They can be birth control uh, where you put the patch on at the appropriate times of the month. Remember to take the old patch off before you apply the new one. Fold it in half so that the medication is stuck upon itself and then you will want to uh, dispose of that appropriately because some medications like your duragesic patch have to be put into a container where um, it would not be uh, gotten by anybody else because the duragesic is considered um, a narcotic, a scheduled medication. In many of the places, the duragesic is folded in half and then put inside the sharps container. But again, follow the protocol of the facility you are working in. Document where you put the new patch so if they have any questions about where that patch should be when they go to remove it the next day, um, they should easily be able to locate that. Ask about patches during a medication history. I remember a story in one of the nursing journals not long ago that talked about a lady that came in unresponsive. Well, she had been putting the duragesic patches on, but nobody had told her to take the old one off. So she had five duragesic patches stuck to her body that was causing her to be unresponsive. And as soon as they took the patches off, cleaned the skin, revived this woman, and gave her the Narcan, she came around. She was a bigger woman and it was very hard to find the patches in her skin uh, because they were hidden in some of her folds of fat. And then make sure you apply a label to the patch if it's difficult to see with your initials, the date you applied it, and any other information that might be important for that. And lastly for this uh, unit is our nasal installation on page 596. Usually the nasal medications are administered uh, calcitonin intranasally. The unwritten rule is that the right nary is used on even days. So on day two, four, six, eight, ten of the month, you go in the right nary if they're every other day. And then on the odd days, it would be the left nary. Make sure that you avoid any abuse of medications because overuse usually leads to rebound effect. That's very common with over-the-counter medications. Many people will overuse them and they for allergies and they will wind up not working because you overuse them. Um, sometimes it's easier to have the patient self-administer the spray because um, they can control when they breathe in and when it squirts. 
and then as we look at the left drawing uh, we'll see then that how they position so that you can get it into the maxillary and frontal sinuses as it's directed in the medication and this is on page 596 in the book on box 3116 thank you